prime means Pakistanis. Charter of Economy for Pakistan means for the Pakistanis. It's Pakistanis for Pakistan. The origin of these crises may in part be attributed to the planning horizon of the government in power. Myopic governments with short planning horizons try to capture the maximum amount of resources during the expected terms. Well, we know what the expected terms are in Pakistan, right? <laughs> okay. Then ignore the effects their policies have on economic activity beyond their expected tenure. Then moving to the second last paragraph, Pakistan needs to adopt a longer term horizon that will create a stronger economic environment able to withstand economic shocks. Furthermore, if these policies are implemented within the democratic process and likelihood of the survival of the political process also increases. Right here in this hotel at the Marriott, after the second prosperity forum, a group of sane economists got together here in the business room and decided to embark on this charter of economy. Because personally, we were hearing other political parties time to time, not all the time, coming up with this proposal that we need to do a charter economy. So therefore, we thought that this would be the ideal time to do it since we are in a transitory period in the history of Pakistan. Caveats for this is, first of all, political stability. The second is strong political will. Third, it's consensus of all stakeholders. And the other caveat, it's the bureaucrats, especially the ones in the 21 and the 22 grade. <laughs> we all know. I, during my student time, I used to watch this TV show. It's called Yes, Minister. <laughs> every time a minister came up with an idea at, at the office every morning, it was always the first and the second guy saying, oh, sir, this can't be done. Oh, it will never get done. Oh, it, it's not going to work. So that, that, that's an issue here in Pakistan, but it's also an issue everywhere in the world. The second caveat, and these are the off-limit caveats, it's the International Monetary Fund. And I don't want to expand on this subject, otherwise I'll lose my focus on the subject. I'll leave it for some other time, or maybe even during some of the question and answer sessions. And the reason basically is that the IMF has never produced a growth program for any country, whether it's Pakistan, or whether it's Egypt, or whether it's uh, Zambia or Ghana or whatever. And the other caveat, and recently I read in the paper that one of our political parties in its po political ma manifesto is planning to revisit the 18th Amendment. Not a good idea. It's going to be a counterproductive for the idea of the charter of economy. Basically, the idea is we don't want to go backwards. We want to go forward. If they're going to put this thing on the table, we're going to lose another five years of bickering amongst ourselves about redoing the charter of democracy, which was a done and deal, a deal that was done. The focus for 2024 should be purely on the economic side, and that is to adhere with the whatever is forthcoming on our presentation of the Charter of Economy for Pakistan. 
the idea behind the charter is based on the six pillars of supply side economics. And this was exposed during Dr. Arthur Laffer's first presentation here at the forum. And he talked about the six pillars. And then I followed that up last year at the second forum. And I just repeated this year that this charter is based on the six pillars of supply side economics. First, low flat tax rates on broad tax basis. Second, spending restraint. Third, free trade. Fourth, sound money. Fifth, deregulation. Sixth, privatization. And this is all for one reason, and it's the reason to accelerate and have a sustainable economic growth rate in Pakistan. Economics is all about incentives, and taxes have consequences. When I was a student at the university, I did two subjects. One was real estate, and the other was economics. The first chapter in any real estate textbook at the university says there are three principles or three th things that matter in doing a successful real estate project. It's called location, location, location. On economics, and especially supply side economics, the three are taxes, taxes, and taxes. To quote Winston Churchill, and he said, a nation trying to tax itself into prosperity is like a, like a man standing in a bucket and trying to lift himself by the handle. <laughs> to attain prosperity, Pakistan needs an annual growth rate of plus 7%. And don't forget, we have a population growth of two and a half. Currently, the IMF is predicting a two and a half percent growth rate. Some others are saying the World Bank may be saying something else. I think it's gonna be far lower. We need, in the end of the day, to grow the pie. As John F. Kennedy said in 1962, a rising tide raises all boats. Okay, I'm gonna give you some ugly fiscal statistics. I love these. Government tax revenues, 10% of GDP. Government expenditure, 20% of GDP. Government budget deficit, 8% of GDP. Government debt to GDP, 80%. Circular debt, you guys all know, it's about 4% to GDP. Now, for me, the most important ugly number, which is very unique, to Pakistan and some other countries, and everybody should concentrate on this number. This is by far the most important number from all other indicators. And that is government debt service to tax revenues. That's the killer. And you know what? For Pakistan today, that's 100%. So when people say, oh, you know, many countries have GD you know, debt to GDP, Japan has 250%. Italy is somewhere around 180, maybe Greece is 150. But those countries don't have the problem that we have when it comes to debt service versus our tax revenues. Please convey this to your neighbor, to your brother, to your mothers, to your sister. That is the indicator. And then we know what the external debt factor is. You know, it's been said 128, 130 billion. Then you got the internal debt factor. It's about 40 trillion. 
And as Mr. Shai had already said, the need of the hour, and I don't see any way out for Pakistan, is that debt restructuring or debt reprofiling or a mix of two is the need of the hour. But I wanted to add to what Dr. Shah had said, that if you, don't, if you do debt restructuring and reprofiling without what we are proposing at the Charter of Economy, a debt restructuring and reprofiling will only benefit the country for maybe two or three years. That's it. It's not going to last longer. We're going to come back to the same cycle of debt distress or near default. The other ugly statistics that I like to talk about is the trade statistics. Exports, 28 billion, 8% of GDP. Imports, 55 billion, 15% of GDP. Remittance, $27 billion. And you know, some politician, I don't know, he talked about the advantage of brain drain. I mean, this guy's got to be sick. He has to be sick in his mind. You're going to let these future, these citizens of Pakistan, the future of Pakistan, to go out there to be able to, 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 to cover your, your current, current account balance issues? What's wrong with this guy, man? <laughs> I mean, it just blows my mind, you know. Like, okay, then we talk about the foreign exchange reserve. You know, it's always the same scenario. We went up, we're down. We went up, we went down. It's at 7.5. Yesterday I heard it's 7.2, it's 7.3. You know what, folks? The Hong Kong Jockey Club endowment today stands at $8.6 billion. And if you want to know about Harvard University's endowment, it's something like $78 billion. So much for people talking about current account issues here. People are obsessed with current account. You know what? If you're so hung up on the dollar, just dollarize your economy, man. It's always the same thing, dollar, dollar. My, even my servant, my driver, dollar, dollar, dollar. What is wrong with you guys, man? <laughs> the balance of payment crisis is primarily, we know that, it's due to the fiscal crisis. This crisis cannot be solved without solving the previous subject of fiscal policy. The third important part is the monetary policy. Money supply growth in the last 12 months in Pakistan has been up 26%. Government borrowing T-bills up 26%. Devaluation of the currency since last year now, 26%. Well, folks, there is no, it's no wonder and it's not a coincidence that we have an inflation rate of 26%. Devaluations is the first factor where it feeds in to the inflation issue. It's a monetary phenomenon, purely monetary phenomenon and nothing else. And inflation is a stealth tax. It's a stealth tax on the population of Pakistan. And on top of that, we have people that have income, the income earners, especially the ones that are on the salary class, and it's called bracket creep. This last budget, they didn't even think about the idea that we have an inflation issue and they didn't budge on the threshold. I was expecting that at least the threshold would go for 600, uh, thousand to at least a million two. They didn't do that. So you automatically put those people that are earning 600,000 further into poverty. The solution for inflation is very simple. It's 
decrease the money supply growth and increase the supply of goods. That is the solution. And I don't want to even talk about the other crazy idea about that. Let's demonetize. Come on, man. Look at what they did in India. You know, they really had a tough time with the poor people. There was absolutely just in a distressed situation because they, they were, it was a cash economy and they lost it all. Okay, now let's go to the main subject, which is the charter itself. Okay. Uh, if you, no, we're at 910. We're not at 910. Who's, who's moving ahead of time? Yeah, okay. Right. So basically, I'm not going to go to each of those things that, that are on, on, on the screen. But I'm going to talk about one, two, three, and five. Basically, on track, fair taxation, and the reason that we put fair taxation on top of the program is because for me that is by far the most important subject. And that is the issue of taxation in Pakistan. So a single flat rate tax on a broad tax base, and I would look at personal income tax, which today stands at 35%. And 35%, I mean, that's absolutely crazy when you compare to our neighboring countries and many other Asian countries. I think a 35% tax should be removed and we should go a flat on a flat tax program and bring it down to 10%. A 10% flat tax on personal income. And on the corporate side, today I think we're somewhere around 39%. And that for me also is a corporate tax that's way out of line compared to many other Asian or even our near neighbors. And that should be brought down to a 20% flat rate. So the corporate rate from 39% down to a 20% flat rate. And whenever I talk about flat rate, it means flat rate. No deductions, no this, no that, just it. That's your gross income. Pay, pay that 20% and that's it. And the other area we're going to talk about is harmonized sales tax. 18%. Come on, folks. Which planet are you living in? All right? Okay, sales taxes in general should be no more than 5 maybe 7%. 18% is a complete insane number. Custom duty, I don't know, 30, 31, something like that. Custom duty is very important if you want to have a trade that works well for both parties, exporters and importers. And that, I don't see a number better than a 5% flat tax on custom duty. Then we got excise duty. I'm a believer in excise duty. And, and, and excise duty for me is the, the, the ones that are on the sin taxes. But then there's a limit to high, how high you can put an excise, excise tax. Okay? So basically an excise tax is to discourage the behavior of the customer. You know, if you don't want him to do this, you raise the excise tax, whatever. But to a limit, okay? There is a limit to it. And all this, when it comes to on the flat tax issue, you have to follow it up and religiously, no exemptions, no concessions, no SROs, no amnesties. And I mean, no. And all these tax, taxes that are right now in place, we know, and I have, it's always evident that the tax base here in Pakistan is extremely narrow. And I mean extremely narrow. I mean, you know, in, we've got income tax filers, five million, okay? And the payers are something like about three million. Corporate tax, majority of them are paid by the, the large 12 sectors where last year the Pakistani uh, Treasury put a 
super tax on. They start, I think they slapped the super tax last year, right? Okay. And they are the bulk payers of the government revenues. And I'm talking about corporations. And sales tax is the other area where about 90% of it's paid by maybe about 400 entities. Now that's a narrow, 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 narrow base. Custom duty, and I've said again, if you want to talk about free trade, maximizing your export, using your imports for the benefit of the industries here, you have to keep a custom duty rate at the lowest level, and I came up with 5%. But in Pakistan, custom duty is looked on, looked on as a revenue instrument. Gotta, gotta go, gotta grab it, man. Hey, take it. And it should not. It should be a trade policy. It's about free trade. It's about how we deal with other countries outside and how they deal with us. You know, it's as simple as that. If Japan has a cure for cancer and America has a cure for lung disease, and it's, they stop trading with it, each other, you know, they, both of them, they suffer. It's like the Japanese won't have a cure for that and the Americans won't have the cure for the other. It's as simple as that. It's not nuclear science, folks. Come on, what will happen when we adapt a flat tax scenario? It results in economic growth. It's all about economic growth. If you got economic growth, like I said, a lot of your problems, they go away. So what will happen is the tax to GDP, and I'm talking about tax to GDP here where I'm standing, it's Pakistan. It's going to shoot up from 9% to 15 to 17%. And I'm not kidding. It can happen. Tax revenues from $9 trillion easily will go to $15 trillion or even beyond. And the tax base will also increase from 10, per 10 million to 15 million. And yesterday I w we were having a discussion, Dr. Sir. You even said maybe it might even end up at 20 million. Is that correct? So basically you're looking at doubling it, 10 million to 20 million. And what will this will create is investments to GDP. Currently, Pakistan is at 15%. This is pathetic, folks. It has to reach a level of at least 25% to GDP, okay? That's a good sign that your economy is opening up and it's creating incentives for many companies that are at the moment in the exit zone so that they can come back to us as investors. And then, you know, we have this issue of direct tax here. Oh. Really, there is no direct tax in Pakistan because 75% 70 of that is in the indirect tax mode. And that is with that withholding tax we have. And I'm gonna come back to that withholding subject in due time. So what will happen in this scenario is that you will see direct tax will go from 40% and go up to 60%. And on the other side, it'll be the reverse. Indirect tax will go from 60% down to 40%. And that's how it should be. The effect on fair taxation and tax re reform is that it has an economic effect. And we know the e economic effect is purely because of the, f the Laffer curve effect. But on the other hand, when you're talking to people at the FBR level or even with the IMF, they look at it from the arithmetic effect. And the arithmetic effect is purely based with the obsession 
on reaching revenue targets, which they never, never, never do or get. And I call, you know what? That's a really, it's, it's, it's really, I would label it, and I don't think not too many people have labeled that. It, you can call it the Rizwan Rauji label. I call these institutions and I call the FBR and the finance ministry. They have started a new study. It's called Abacus Economics. <laughs> Incentives, economic growth will shift the informal economy in Pakistan, which today I think it's around something like 40%, to the formal economy. And this is how you create an economy that will lead to a booming economy. Let's look at what is, what is GDP, okay? I, I, if you look at and Google it, GDP, GDP is consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports, which is basically export minus input. People, many economists here, you know, and they're, trust me, there are plenty of crazy economists here, okay? And they always talk about, oh, we've been going through this boom, bust, boom, bust, boom, bust cycle. Well, you know what? The reason why you're going through this boom, bust cycle is purely because your GDP is based on government spending and on consumption. My definition of GDP is not those two indicators. It's investments and exports. That's the reason why we have this boom and bust. If you follow my principle, it's gonna be a boom, 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 boom. And we're not gonna see a bust for a long period of time. Number four is agricultural income. Now we need to really focus on this because for me, I think it's a very, very, very important area of, of the charter economy. I f and we firmly believe that it should, it should be taken away from the provinces and it should be handed over to the federal government. And agriculture is, is a 20% part of our GDP. Okay, that's not a small number. And we know that 1% of farmers own 22% of farmlands. And we also know that 5% of farmers own about 60% of the farmlands. The net annual income of the top 20% and I'm talking about the, you know, the, the, the landowners, the whatever. Uh, their annual income, the last number I got, was something like 980 billion tax. But in tax revenues, they paid three billion. Now folks, that's not fair, all right? That's not fair. What we need to do is seriously start mapping of the farmlands. I mean, there, people don't know, I mean, what part belongs to who and all that, and you know, that needs to be done. That, that's very, very important. And we need to incentivize high productivity. And that can only come by creating cooperatives, because I don't know if you guys really have studied cooperatives, but in many African countries, they're doing wonderful in agricultural production based on cooperatives and then doing it in an industrial way, all right? That's important. This is for me the real killer in Pakistan. It's called withholding taxes. Yeah, FBI, here I come. Okay, we got about over 50 withholding taxes, okay? I mean, this is ridiculous. And these regimes with very, very high tax rates. And 55% of the revenue collected, my God, it's at the import stage. I mean, come on, folks. And then these importers have to deal with multiple tax agencies. <sighs> and you know what? Withholding tax from the very beginning is already 
it's a constraint on working capital for companies. And then on top, the government has long delays in releasing these tax refunds. And then they have to go to a bank and borrow at 22% interest rates. Now, come on, folks. You're already killing the goose at the entry. All right? You might as well knock him off and say, forget, don't even bother to enter my room, man. We'll just kill you at the door. It's basically you, they're killing everybody at the door, the entry door, which I call at the import level. Number seven is subsidies. No subsidies, no targeted subsidies should be replaced by tax cuts and cash transfers. Number nine and number 10 is spending restraint. Basically duplication, closing down of federal departments that have been devolved to provinces and everybody's talking about that. Number 10, no new development projects until existing, uh, existing ones are complete. Number 11, stop free petrol, free electricity, free plots. Like Milton Friedman said, there is no such thing as a free lunch. Number 14, pensions reform should be, you know, Pension reform is basically unfunded liability to the federal government. It's unfunded. And it's not only here, it's everywhere in the world. And this has to be gradually eliminated. And there has to be a parallel that should be created and that we're proposing as an SVP or a special vehicle purpose. And that money is like a kitty. And that should be invested in long-term returns to whoever has paid into it. Number 16. Budgeting, parliament will rigorous, rigorously debate the annual budget. And we know that every time here there's an annual budget announced, it's done in a matter of seconds. Number 17, social protection, negative income tax for borrow for below income tax threshold. I mean, that makes sense. I mean, if you're below a certain threshold, the government should actually give you money. And then I think here in Pakistan, we have a, a program, BISP, which is fantastic, which is all based on cash transfers. And I think these 9.3 million families really do deserve this benefit. And I, th I, and I think it should be indexed to inflation. Okay, number 18, that's, it's, it's a no-brainer, free markets. Free markets activate a country's economic immune system. The next thing is trade deals, which is important. I think currently Pakistan is working on GSP plus. And then we have some regional trade deals as well, the PSW, and the newly created agreement, the TIR, which is the Transport International Router. And government should not intervene and set setting prices, which is the last part, which is price control. Private property, the simple answer is the business of the state is to govern and not to run business. I'm not going to talk anything beyond that, okay? Number 20, state property. State property, that's a huge asset. And it creates negative cash flows to the government. You have to take benefit of the state properties and that the state property should be up for sale or long-term leases. That's a lot of revenues. Folks, this is not wealth that is under the ground. It's right there, right there, you can touch it. But the only problem here in Pakistan, there is no such thing as a master plan. A master plan is important. You have to have a proper master plan in order to have a successful sale of long-term leases on state property. And these state properties are primarily to the benefit of the industry and for commercial use. Pakistan has got a dual malaise. Now, it's, this is not a, just a dual malaise of Pakistan. I've, been, I've lived and grown up in, in Africa. I've spent years and years in many countries in Africa, including South Africa, East Africa, Congo, whatever. 
It's called elite capture and the system of patronage. This is not uniquely Pakistan. It's everywhere. It's happening in all these developing, underdeveloped countries, okay? Which I don't think is a serious matter just for Pakistan, but it's a serious matter for the global south. And what this does, it breeds corruption, it breeds nepotism, cronyism, and the leaders need to rise above self-interest and recognize merit and talent. And we have them right here in this room. To be in the best national interest and a more inclusive and transparent society will lead to a better governance, accountability, and economic policies. The Constitution of Pakistan must be upheld with an elected government by the people, for the people, and a competent and functioning executive, legislative, and judicial branch. Only then we will see economic prosperity for Pakistan. Pakistan, Zindabad.